Should we start? Yeah, okay. Can you hear me? So yes. hello, hello everyone, and welcome to our fourth episode of Art Talks, a series of online conversations with artists, writers, curators, and collectors. We are very pleased to have Pallavi Paul and Shuddhavata Sengupta with us today. And this talk is being held to, is held, being held together with Pallavi's solo, which opened at the gallery yesterday. And this is Pallavi's third solo with us. Pallavi's practice interrogates how the idea of truth is produced and imaged in public life. Paul is particularly interested in poetic explorations of the tension between the document and its aesthetic utterance, the documentary. Her work has been exhibited in various venues, including the International Film Festival of Rotterdam, very recently in 2021, in the Rubin Museum, in Savi Contemporary, and at the Tate Modern. Paul recently received her PhD in Cinema Studies from GNU, New Delhi, and is currently a resident, a resident at DAAD Berlin. Shuddhavrata Sengupta is an artist and writer and a member of Rux Media Collective, who also show with us at Project 88. Rux is a group that combines research, historical and philosophical inquiry and contemporary art. In 2002, Sengupta co-initiated Sarai, a platform for discursive partnerships between theorists, researchers, practitioners and artists engaged in reflecting on contemporary urban spaces and cultures in South Asia at the Center for the, at the, Center for the Study of Developing Societies, Delhi. Okay, um, I would just like to make a couple of points before we start this conversation off. Um, the last time I met Shuddham Pallavi was in March, which was a few, week, few weeks before the devastating second wave of the pandemic in India. In our last conversation where we had many artists from the gallery in a virtual preview, we spoke about materiality, virtuality, and speculated about a future which seemed quite uh, near, a future free of the pandemic. And we joined in from various different corners of the world, something that was kind of not possible. And, you know, we were excited about that. So today, Pallavi joins us from Berlin, Shuddha is joining us from Delhi, and I'm here at the gallery in Mumbai. Uh, the scale and the devastation of the second wave has, I think, forced us to think very deeply of loss and absence. And I think this show has some of those themes, memory, history, grief, political unrest, and instability. I think as art as app practitioners, we have to ask ourselves what the ongoing pandemic has meant for our exhibition calendar and for our art practices. As a gallery, we've had to be frugal, nimble, prepare for very short or very long exhibitions depending on lockdown status, and be very thoughtful and sensitive with our presentations. We have presented two online shows since March. We've done an online art fair. We've had a sculpture solo at the gallery by Khageshwar Raut which was very tactile and fragile at the same time. The current show, look, Pallavi's show, looks at a time horizon between the events of the last two years, while also speaking of, to the collapse of language, the appearance of strange lockdown dreams, the eruption and disruption of intimacy. The Heart of the Heart, which is the title of her solo, attempts to move through the detritus of dead time that prevents us from identifying sites of injury as we are lacerated in multiple places. Uh, before I hand over to Pallavi and Shuddha, just a few housekeeping rules. Please keep your uh, microphones and videos off. If you're having any technical problems, just uh, you know, type on the chat and we will try to assist you. So over to you, Pallavi and Shuddha. Thanks so much for that, Sri. Um, and um, I think I just before um, uh, I request uh, Dia and Sabiha to take us through a little walkthrough of the show, um, I just want to say um, a little bit about the show. And um, and some of it has already been in many ways sort of addressed by Shri in her opening comments, which is that um, this show sort of comes out of, of efforts to apprehend really the last um, uh, two years, right? Um, because... Uh, and these have been, um, uh, you know, uh, this has been a time which has uh, been a time of suffering, of, uh, you know, abrupt departures of loved ones, of friends, of, uh, you know, uh, intellectual companions in, in some cases. 
uh, but this has also been a time of uh, you know inventive strategies of you know pushing back uh, and uh, of protest of resistance as well uh, and you know so uh, there have been climate catastrophes right now we are seeing in our immediate neighborhood you know complete political instability the scale of suffering of course the devastating second wave um, you know, things about virality, contagion, things that we're beginning to understand about our body, right, that we didn't really have um, either the means or uh, the circumstances, you know, to assemble, to rethink, to reassemble. Um, so in many ways, um, you know, the show is one response that I have had to this ongoing process of trying to make sense of this time. What does it now mean? Uh, you know, what, what does political articulation look like or, or sound like now? What does it mean for the family? What does it mean for friendships? What does it mean for uh, ideas of intimacy? What does it mean, um, you know, and, and can we create from this um, time, which has taken so much in so many ways from so, you know, from us? Um, so I, I'm um, trying to deal or grapple with this question through the works in the show, but I mean, which is one sort of site um, through which I'm trying to process this time. Uh, and I think that uh, in the conversation today, I'm looking forward to other kind of critical pressures that can emerge um, in this landscape and help me perhaps extend or reassemble or, or you know, sort of revisit some of these questions and ideas in interesting ways. Um, uh, so yeah, I'd like to, uh, with that, request perhaps uh, Dia or uh, Sabiha to take us through a little walkthrough. <laughs> or maybe there's some technical issues there if if the walkthrough um can't happen now maybe we'll come back to it and okay Here you see the film, The Black Gambit. We can move uh, perhaps the now towards the scroll, uh, towards the shroud. This work is called The Heart of the Heart, which is also the name of the show.
this series of works is called Out of Place. These are drawings. Thanks, dear. Thanks. So, I um, guess I'd like Shuddha to come in now. And yeah, and just one thing to say is that the uh, pandemic not just informs the works themselves, I guess, but also the ways in which we're also installing shows now and how we can even access them. So. This has also been quite an experience to install the show from a distance. Yeah. Um, thank you, Pallavi, and thank you, Sri, and the team at Project 88 for uh, this uh, opportunity to have this conversation in the middle of this strange time. Um, it's a delight to, to sense Pallavi's show from a distance. Like she said, this is the opportunity that this time gives us to think differently about what we are presented with. So um, I think what Pallavi and I are gonna do is to, we haven't really rehearsed this conversation. We've just, we've, um, we've viewed some of its promontories, some of the high, high, high points that emerge and we've gently looked at them and passed by, but we'll return to them. Um, my first response to the materials in the show, and I've seen them grow over time because for instance, The Blind Rabbit is a film that um, we commissioned as part of Five Million Incidents, which was a project at the Goethe Institute, Delhi and Calcutta, which Rux was one of the catalysts for. Um, and Pallavi was one of the, what we call actors. And she developed this piece of work uh, initially as a performance between a screen-based work and her own presence and voice. And now it's a full-fledged, uh, amazing film. So I've seen that emerge over some time, as well as learned more about the other uh, components of the work. Um, the first thing that strikes me is that um, this is an occasion for us to talk about the relationship between seeing things and sensing them, um, which are sight, vision is a sense, but a sense has its vision, I mean, in a way. Uh, and there's a relationship between the heart and the eye, between uh, which is quite, you know, an interesting thing. I mean, we, we all know of what it means to say, you know, that's something called love at first sight, but there's also other ways of relating the heart and the eye. Um, one of the um, first signs of, let's say, heart disease um, is often diagnosed when ophthalmologists look at the eye and they see the buildup of what is called retinal pressure. And if they, if they see microclots in the, in the eye, um, they begin to suspect that the person might have heart disease. So there's a really strange and intimate connection between the pressure in the eye and the pressures in the heart. Um, there's a wonderful saying uh, or call of um, Hazrat Ali ibn Abi Talib, who is the was the you know the first rightly guided um, imam for the Shia community? He says that um, the heart, um, the heart vision of the eye is limited, and the vision of the heart transcends all barriers of time and space. So there's an 
idea that the heart somehow through its sensory capacities through the capillaries and the vessels is able to see things and see things that are not just obvious, uh, which is how I would like to approach this whole body of works. Um, Pallavi sees things with her heart and she invites our hearts to see with her through her eyes and through her heart. And there are a few things that I want to talk about with relation to each of the works, but I think we'll come to them at a time. What I want to do right now is ask you, Pallavi, what is this sense of sense that you had? What, did you, what does your heart see in this time? I mean, there is this, there is this you know, it's, it's this time I think it makes very specific demands on the heart. Um, and I think it makes very specific demands on the senses. And a large part of uh, negotiating this time has also been whether to, how attendant one can be to those demands. Um, so I, I think, for example, you know, absence um, uh, and emptiness has been um, something that is, you know, I've, I've been thinking about quite a lot, right? Because um, this has sort of come and, and, and right, it intersects, it sort of moves across with this kind of um, very potent velocity, you know, through our political lives, through our emotional landscapes, through our, uh, you know, memories, uh, you know, which have also come back to us in a very specific way because of the pandemic and because of the uh, various kinds of ways in which time has passed uh, in the in the pandemic. So I think that one of the things that I have been or, or you know trying to sense or trying to trying to you know uh, through my heart uh, has been this uh, um, how to how how to sort of think of loss as as not something that paralyzes you or makes you unable to act or say anything. Right? But how loss is able to actually catalyze a certain kind of capacity, unlock a certain capacity, right? For thought, for contemplation, or and by extension for action. You know? um, and I think that um, this is uh, again there are various ways in which this has also played out in the world around us. You mm -hmm. know, whether we're looking at the farmers' protest, for example. You know, the act of being, you know, stationed at a border to stop something in order to actually set something off, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, very interestingly, you know, uh, when the uh, second, just before the second wave, you know, a demand was made to vaccinate all protesters, mm -hmm. right? Um, so also inoculating, uh, you know, this certain kind of uh, capacity for resistance, right? Yeah. As with the full awareness that something quite lethal and, and literally, uh, you know, something that can kill you is, is around you all of the time. Um, I think uh, also losses of friends, you know, losses in, in personally in the family, etc. Uh, have also instantiated this, this process. Um, and, and finally, I think this is also at the same time, very strangely been a very generative time creatively. Uh, for me, and and I think also, you know, when I look around, like, you know, very many interesting propositions are also being produced, uh, you know, so this was also the time that I finished my PhD, and this is also the time that I uh, have made this film, and this is also the time that I've sent, tried to sense it, sense it through another sort of public project, you know, which was Share Your Quiet. So this is also, there is also a continuous need, I think, um, to be able to make sense of this loss or lack um, as a being fully aware of its horror, being fully aware of the demands that it's making on our hearts, but also not letting that become a, a seizing of possibilities. Mm. Um, yeah. I mean, I was very struck by a small work in which is part of the suite of drawings and collages uh, which you call out of date, which already dates the work as something out of time. It speaks for more than one time. And it's, I know you like, <clears throat> we both love dictionaries, right? I mean, I, I've seen a work of yours, which is uh, cut up of dictionaries before in Newcastle some years ago. And um, we've talked about obsessively reading dictionaries um, as a way to unlocking the secrets of language. And there's a particular and this work has many dictionary entries, I noticed. I don't think 
in the walkthrough, you can get a sense of the fact that these are minute dictionary entries that then get surrounded by drawings. Uh, there's a particular one that, that really drew my attention. It's called, uh, it's the one about the heart. Uh, it's an expanded dictionary definition for the word heya, which is a beautiful word in Hindustani and in other languages as well. Uh, I, in Bengali, we have it as well. And, and there's a wonderful song by Tagore, which goes, um, it's a thought that is, you know, occurs in many different times. And it says, Amar hiyar maje lukye chilen, dekhte ami paini, which means, you were hidden in my heart and I couldn't see you. So it's a trope in, for instance, in Baul um, music or poetry about what they call the Moner Manush. It's the, the secret person who is, uh, who, is, who is hidden within you and you can't see him or her or them. And it requires a sec special kind of second sight or insight to be able to see that what you're looking for is not actually far away from you, but that it is inside. So that generative site, let's say that you're talking about. Um, your title, uh, I remember you telling me, is uh, a riff of an expression used by the um, actually for much of his life stateless mathematician, Alexander Grothendieck, who's a kind of hero for um, us in rocks. Uh, because he was part of a collective called Bourbaki and uh, was a mathematical pioneer in many ways and a political dissident. And he used this expression, right? Heart of the heart, isn't that what you told me? As a kind of zone of what can be called negation norm normally, but which then is generative. It, it's the void that allows for the production of a new sensibility. So could you tell us a little bit about why this is the heart of the heart for you? Mm. Yeah, so, you know, one of the ways, again, when I was trying to, uh, because obviously these works were getting produced through these, through these, um, through this time, uh, and some of them uh, are, you know, um, sort of also trying to affiliate themselves to a time horizon, which is beyond these two years. But when I was um, uh, trying to find a way to sort of um, thread it together, or like, you know, I was trying to glimpse actually at this weave and, and you know, how it's uh, put together. This idea really helped me. Grothendieck's idea really helped me because, um, um, you know, it's different, this idea that he, so this is, of course, an abstract space, mm. the heart of the heart that he proposes. It's a mathematical uh, space, but, you know, the fact that Grothendieck was also, also mystic, you know, he was also, uh, as he was a descendant, and he was also somebody who eventually, um, you know, sort of lost track of, of you know, um, he extricated himself from, um, you know, the discipline of mathematics, yeah. essentially, towards the end of his life, etc., but this space is very interesting and in a way it marks his withdrawal uh, from, um, uh, you know, uh, the discipline of mathematics, but it marks his entry or um, sort of insertion into a larger mode of making mm. sense of the world politically, right? right. Through a certain kind of, uh, I would say, radical mysticism. And this idea, because it, it's at the cusp, it's located at the cusp of this move from uh, complete analysis and logic into trying to sense the world. Mm. Uh, you know, in addition to logic, you, you need all of these other faculties um, to, to make sense of polit politics and political <laughs> action. This idea was very useful because he differentiates this space, this abstract space, the heart of the heart from say a black hole. Right, a black hole is dense and and black and dark because it has so much concentration of matter mm. in it. It pulls everything towards it, right? Mm. So in many ways, it's the ultimate positive. It has the capacity of everything uh, being inside of it. And what happens eventually is a black hole basically implodes upon itself. It collapses, right, in due time because of that. This is um, also so in, in many ways, he's he's creating an entity which is also then supposedly um, seemingly blank or dark, but not because it's a positive, not because it's a composite of everything that it can pull inside of it, but because it's precisely the opposite. Mm. So it is that empty space, which according to Grothendieck had the potential to illuminate the foundations of mathematical knowledge, but in itself, it's it's a blank. 
right mm. in itself this this abstract space is a space that's devoid of uh, positivity mm. right yeah yeah isn't there a way in which um, i'm going to skirt around some of the works for instance you have this the sheet is a rectangular tall uh, sheet the shroud. yes the shroud yeah. right and isn't there a way in which this relationship between uh, the vacation of information uh, the the taking away of images from um, uh, from a surface um, and you you perhaps might want to tell us a little bit about how you processed this time of the pandemic and its and its distress as a kind in, through the through the actual erasure through the gradual uh, seeing of images in their absentia and i will come back to images in absentia later but there's a kind of heart of the heart ness to this work where the negation or the 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 non presence of something it's actually indicative of the presence i mean famously shrouds do that the turin shroud is supposed to be an image of the of the crucified and dead christ um, imprinted on a cloth some people say it was i mean there are many such cloths as a woman called veronica who sort of wiped his face and uh, his face got on to the cloth and therefore other faces or other cloths got other impressions maybe the turin shroud is one or maybe it isn't but what i'm trying to say is that here is the the vacation or the absence of life leaving a trace on an uh, through an i don't know whether to call it an image or a non image or how you see it uh, but perhaps you could get on to that yeah yeah no absolutely i think the shroud of turin was always a, a strong reference point for this work um the process of making this work is that it's essentially uh, you know all the images that were coming out of the devastating you know uh, the, the second wave basically the horror of the second wave uh and the fact that you know crematoriums were running out of space there were all of these drone shots of you know bodies being cremated in in kind of all of these uh, you know makeshift ways Uh, the long queues outside hospitals etc now there was this sort of journalistic attempt and and those images were of course both shocking but they were also numbing uh, after a while uh, you know the just the sheer scale of the violence and the destruction and um you know they were passing through our minds our consciousness in this kind of everyday sort of way while we were also trying to fire fight you know Uh, uh more emergencies that were close to home right uh, in terms of close friends or family etc and uh, you know there was in some ways i think the fact that they these images were so also easily in a way forgotten in this cycle of like in a, in a very typical news cycle you know very quickly they also went out of circulation uh, mm. right also i think brings our should bring our attention to the fact of the sort of the shakiness of the claim of positive of the of the, of positivity right mm-hmm. of positivist ways of capturing the world um uh, because one would imagine that after having witnessed so mm-hmm. much horror and such scale of uh, you know a death uh you know this would just become part of lived memory in this in this kind of very you know in the in a way that would alter our right. uh, you know articulation our decisions our behaviors right when that when that isn't happening or when clearly you know that has not been uh, the case how do we then begin to deal with this um, kind of mountain of positivist images that are mm-hmm. around us which also moved us you know mm-hmm. so in a way i thought that the the to to try and um, establish a conversation between the shroud of turin and this work would have, would be interesting because the shroud of turin is one of the earliest instances that perhaps sets off this debate about what that image is is it a is it a depleted positive is it a negative of the mm-hmm. image right and by negative i mean again you know the negative in in a cinematic sense right from where the image can also be renewed from where the uh, modes to sense images can continuously be remade right so a negative can be processed again and again and again uh whereas the positive once if if not preserved can just wither and and disappear right it doesn't have generative capacity mm. so it is the fact that the negative has a generative capacity it is also the fact that in our immediate um, you know world we are seeing 
that um, this claim of you know or, or uh, this uh, to produce a witness is not enough yeah. to generate new thought right this is not the end or this is not the the final mode through which any kind of creative act can happen we are not we, i refuse to just be a witness and i refuse to produce witnesses only through my work yeah okay. i mean one fascinating thing about objects like the shroud of turin is that there is a debate about who is the author of the image mm -hmm. um and and that ranges from a discussion of whether this is a forgery to whether this is an image produced by fate time and destiny and therefore some would say god um, in in uh, Christian theological discussions, there's an actual term for it, which is called acheopoieton, the image that is not authored by hands. Mm. Because, you know, I mean, we, we remember that in the time when icons were being made, all icons were made by hand. Mm. And there is a class of icons, and the Shroud of Turin is sometimes placed in that class which is icons that have not been made by anybody, but which generated themselves out of time. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the images that are the result of the depleted traces, which the negatives produce for you, uh, the images that, that are images produced by time rather than by our, um, uh, rather than by our retrieval of them, become interesting and that connects me to the um to the film you've made blind rabbit because it has at key moments the absence of the image and a persistence of the image an image that refuses to disappear even when somebody tries to shut it down uh, and there's a key moment uh, in the film where um the police enter the jamia library the jamia university library it's your university and my university. So we both uh, have an attachment to it. And I saw that image the night it came out at three in the morning, it came to me like it came to many other people. And it was an incredibly horrifying image of the Delhi police commandos entering and, and destroying a library and pursuing students. In the middle of doing that, there is this very ironic moment where a policeman hits a surveillance camera. So we are accustomed to thinking about surveillance cameras as instruments of um, control. But here, when the law decides to step outside the law, it has to destroy the mechanisms of control and evidence. But the interesting thing is that he is not able to destroy the camera. And your, uh, the clip that you've used actually produces and generates that element of the persistence of that vision which is not authored by hand but remains right um it, it brings me back to another hazrat ali quote which says that the heart preserves what the eye sees vision itself is an ephemeral thing it comes and goes in front of our eyes but what we see remains um a kind of artifact that uh, keeps calling on us keeps pulling us back in our memory, in our heart, in our mind, and in our consciousness. Um, and that's, that's a very fascinating thing. And I think the Blind Rabbit film is full of instances where there's, there's an act, there's a willing act of recalling something that would, many people would want otherwise forgotten, right? Or many forces would want otherwise forgotten. Not necessarily because they're in their indictments, but also because there may be minor strands and hmm. distract from the telling of major stories. Um, I want to come back to that. I just, uh, but let, let me just say that now this year, 2021, is the centenary of a phrase that we've all heard, which is called Inkalab Zindabad, right? Um, which means long live revolution. It's something that you've always heard at a demonstration and always hear at a protest gathering or whatever. But nobody really spends time thinking about the word inkhalab itself, what, what it means, right? And khalab, when you, when you break it down, comes from the root word in Arabic, qalb, which is the heart. So inkhalab, revolution or transformation, is actually the motion of the heart. It's the waves, the upsurge within the heart of human beings, and therefore the heart of time and the heart of the world. So 
to now think of your film as the vision of the heart is a, is a fascinating way to enter the blind rabbit and the problem of sight and blindedness, which your film talks about in very beautiful and poetic ways. Yeah, um, I mean, I had no idea that, um, you know, in collab was really can be seen of, you know, can be thought of as this, as this heart of the heart in a way. And, um, and I think for me, um, the inability to see, uh, and I think this is also, I mean, while the blind rabbit is actually, and I was looking at very also concrete questions, of institutionalized violence, of state violence, of you know um, kidnappings that were you know done by the police, um, by all of these sort of um, uh, you know by 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 state murders basically yeah. by the state, right? Um, so it's also not a uh, not a recall in order to resolve or in order to actually tie it up. Right. The fact that these records have been for first fake records were created. Right. And like then, during the emergency, which, uh, yeah. Exactly. And then they were destroyed. Yeah. Right. So, what does it mean? What does this double erasure actually even mean? You produce a lie and then you extinguish the lie. And that's where your entire sort of, you know, narratives, the state narrative emerges from around these, um, you know, key moments, right? Yeah. So I was interested in these also very concrete questions. And what is that order of blindness? Mm. Right? Um, it's a blindness that has been actually conjured. Uh, yeah. And then is vision the response to that conjuration? Is, 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 the, is to gravitate towards ultimate transparency, complete surveillance, a, a complete a positivist, you know, sort of linear, uh, enlightened uh, sort mm -hmm. of thing. Is that a response to it? Or can another form of blindness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, be a, uh, a, in conversation with this kind of mm -hmm. other you know, uh, top down kind of blindness, right, mm -hmm. that is being imposed. And that is what I was trying to think about. So that instance of the police uh, uh, trying to destroy the surveillance camera, it, it produces the camera as this very interesting device, right? It, it completely, it de-affiliates it mm -hmm. in a certain kind of way from state power. Yeah. And what does it mean to extend these moments? And cinema, cinema allows us to do that. Uh, you know, durationally, I've just extended it. And I think that that has its own. And, and, and in some cases, I thought to completely redact the image was the best sort of a uh, way in which to re-enter, uh, uh, you know, thought about this moment, as opposed to just being feeling plummeled, you know, by it. So all the videos, you know, the horrifying videos of the police attacking and lati charging, um, yeah. Ladida, <clears throat> you know, like um, that yeah. video, et cetera. I mean, I've completely... Yeah, we, you hear the voices of the women protecting the young man that the police is attacking, but you do not see that image because actually we've all seen that image. It's imprinted in our consciousness. Exactly. So, uh, I mean, I find your refusal to enter uh, the zone of, okay, let's show you what hmm. you already know, but you're asking us not to see, but to see with our inner eyes, if you like. Um, yeah. Something that we... And it's also a way of disassembling the present, yeah. the, you know, the connection between the present and the contemporary. Yeah. It's a very specific way to disassemble that uh, very burdensome connection. Right. Uh, and um, so what happens if the present, your immediate present becomes a memory, is posed as a memory. So mm -hmm. while we're witnessing these images, like, you know, whatever, a few weeks, um, just, you know, these images aren't very old, but when they already are posed cinematically in, in the structure of the film as a memory, yeah. I think that does something. It provokes a certain order of, of action or of articulation, which, for example, journalism can't do, which, uh, yeah. you know, all of these others. So I think that's something that art can enable. Yeah. I, I remember that that incident of the police entering the library happened in on the, I think, on the 15th of December, uh, and which was a Friday. And in the Monday following that Friday, some of us were in Jamia and we were asking, I was asking this question, where is the footage from the library? There must be some. And people said, we don't know, but maybe they were turned off. And lo and behold, they turned up. 
And they turned up actually on the 5th of February, uh, on the night of the 5th of February, which is a fascinating day because it is the raising day of the Delhi police. Mm. And it is my um, hunch that the leak of the footage came mm. from a source within the police. Someone mm. with perhaps a troubled conscience because I knew that the hard drives of the cameras were given to the police and the images appeared as if out of nowhere, as if out of the heart of the heart, if you like, right? Mm. Um, uh, which makes, me, and, and, I, and I was thinking about the voice, the gentleman who actually in the film talks about fake records and then erasure. And he's also, if I'm not mistaken, the person who talks about um, 1984 and the stench of the morgue. Yes. Uh, which is the mortuary in Sabzi Mandi. Those of you who will see the film will notice this moment where a particular mortuary is talked about. And every time I've seen, this is the fourth time I've seen the film, my hair stands on an end because I have been in that mortuary and I know that smell, right? It's that peculiar combination of formaldehyde and decomposing um, bodies. It's, it, there is a sweetness to that smell that is quite scary. Um, and when he talks about that, that moment, I think it might be an interesting moment for us to actually see a fragment, that particular fragment of 1984 remembered. Yeah, sure. We have that. Um, can I request? Yeah. Can we make it full screen, please? Eighty four roads के बाद जो क्या है सिखों की भी हमने तो वो सीन देखा है जिसे आदमी देख नहीं सकता देख ले तो सपने में भी महीनों डरेगा लाशें ऐसे पड़ी हुई थी सब्जी मंडी जहाँ को स्मार्टम होता है जैसे ईटों के ढेर पड़े हो जैसे बोरियां पड़ी हो पेट फूल के इतने मोटे मोटे हो गए और लाश के ऊपर लाश पड़ी सैकड़ों लाशें दिल्ली से आई हुई आदमी डर जाए देख नहीं सकता पहचान नहीं है खून में सना पड़ा है सारा सिर फूटे हुए हैं बाल खून में तरम तर है हमने तो वो सीन देखे ऐसा नहीं है कि जो मिनटों सेकंड में हो गया प्रीप्लेट नहीं था लेकिन बिल्कुल उसके बाद प्रोग्राम था कतई आम आदमी को लेना देना था लूट से और पूरे मौका मिल गया ना चाहते हुए भी लोग जो है उसमें शामिल हुए सिर्फ लूट के लिए उन्होंने बेशक ना मारा हो किसी को लेकिन लूटा तो और ये सब उनके बी एस पर ये बड़ी बहुत ही विभत्स सीन था आदमी देख नहीं सकता हम तो कई कई दिन हमें जाना पड़ा पोस्टमार्टम कराने के लिए आदमी सांस नहीं ले सकता फरलांग कई के फरलांग तक एक फरलांग तक कच, उधर कचहरी तक बदबू आती थी तीस हजार कोट तक इतनी बुरी स्मेल लाशें सड़ गई आइडेंटिफाई नहीं हो पा रहे सड़ने का मकसद ही है आइडेंटिफाई नहीं हो पा रहे आइडेंटिफिकेशन में बड़ा टाइम लगा बहुत बुरा समय था Okay, um, I think um, what, what is really interesting for me is the fact that any memory like this is really like a rabbit hole. You enter it and then you have forking paths that take you in different directions. 
which is exactly what happens to us in your film. We enter at different points. We enter through a walk in the snow as if uh, I don't know whether we are the tiger of Kedarnath Singh's poem, Bagh, or whether we are being pursued by the tiger of Kedarnath Singh's poem, The Bagh in the Snow. But through that walk, we reach a place where we begin entering different, different kind of rabbit holes of memory uh, with the blind, with perhaps blind rabbit. Uh, there's 1984, there's 1975, the emergency. There's a story of masquerade, of doubling and splitting. Um, you deploy some of my favorite characters like the great, uh, the great thinker and philosopher of our time, the PC Sorkar Sr., who I think gave us gifts that we're still trying to deal with, like the water of India and so on. And you take us through this, the story of lost children and the particular lost child who says the only way he can identify uh, his house where he came from, where he's picked up as a vagabond by the Delhi police is by saying it's the house with the blind rabbit. And that's amazing because the blind rabbit has taken us through all these parts in the rabbit. Um, and I, I was thinking a bit about rabbits and where I've come across problems of their vision. And um, I don't know how many of you people listening may have read the, the beautiful story, which as a child, I was completely fascinated by called Watership Down, which is a story about rabbits. And there's an expression about what happens to rabbits when strong light is put on their face. And the, the writer, I forget his name, Richard Adams, maybe, he says he invented a word for it. He said, rabbits get tharned, T-H-A-R-N-E-D, uh, which means the blindness produced by an excess of light shining on their eyes. And then they stop frozen in their tracks. And I was thinking about this relationship between blindness walking, foraging, being stopped in your tracks, going back again as a way of thinking about the film. And there's another very peculiar thing about rabbits and sight. Rabbits have actually very good eyesight for seeing things in the round, like 360 degrees, which is why they can see a, a hawk in the sky far above them, which could be a predator very easily. But if you, come, if you were to come right in front of them, they wouldn't be able to see you. There's a blind spot that, um, that happens in rabbits because of the shape of their eyes. They've evolved to look more carefully at what's above them because they hug the ground, they're tiny animals. But when you come right in front of them, they don't know who you are, which is perhaps a lot like what happens between us, history and memory. When things are staring at us in the face, like the pandemic, like the time we're living in, they're more difficult to see. And when we, when they, when they form the canopy, the, the sky above us of events of time of history, then maybe a certain kind of vision becomes possible again. And these processes are what I learned from by paying close attention to your work and to your film. Um, what's fascinating for me is that this produces a bifocality, uh, you know, like bifocal, glasses, you see two things at the same time. Um, and it's, it's a hidden secret, I think, of the uh, Kedarnath Singh's poem, Bagh, where he talks about the fact that the first the tigers, you know, you can sense them, and then he fills your consciousness. And he's everywhere. There's no space in the senses which is free of the tiger. And for me, that's kind of a way of thinking about the relationship between a declared emergency and an undeclared emergency, right? So 1975 was that distortion of the constitutional framework where our fundamental rights were suspended and it was a state of exception. But now with laws like UAPA and so on, there doesn't even require to be a constitutional state of exception. The tiger is everywhere, right? So he's, the tiger is so general that while he's in front of our eyes, it becomes very difficult to see him. We can only sense him. Um, so this is a way of thinking about time that 
about rep repetition, but not identity, because this is not 1975. This is not 1984. It's something else. But 1975 and 1984 prepared the grounds for the tiger being where the tiger is today inside mm -hmm. our hearts and eyes. Yeah. So I think that's fascinating, uh, Shuddha, also because in a way now, uh, the way you set up the rabbit's vision, which is basically the rabbit is like farsighted and blind at the same time. Uh, and in a way, uh, if I were to think again, if I were to bring also the question of aesthetics into the conversation, I also feel like um, in a way, perhaps the way Kedar Kedarnath Singh's poem is the rabbit's vision of the tiger. Yeah. Right. There is no, nobody sees the tiger in its entirety. Uh, and in fact, perhaps that is the error, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, to try and see something in its entirety, to defer action, to defer thought to the point when we when we will be able to see something in it, in, in entirety. You know, I think that is the uh, thing that the work is urging us to not do. Mm. You know? um, uh, the seduction uh, of this promise of entirety, mm. I think, is also something that uh, uh, we should try and not fall into, whether it's aesthetics, whether yeah. it's politics and all of this, right? So um, so th that is one, um, definitely, I think that's one aspect. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I think the other is about, uh, uh, you know, the foraging um, things, you know, as you go along, uh, you make a reserve, you know, you make reserves of capacities, of possibilities. And I think that the other thing that the film is also trying to somehow, um, uh, you know, uh, try and uh, glimpse, right? And I won't want to use the word excavate because I don't think things are necessarily, you know, under layers and layers of things, you know. Sometimes they're just on the surface as we saw, you know, in the Jamia videos, etc. It is the very surface of the image that tells us mm. something. But it's also like, what is actually the texture of repression that we are yeah. living through, right? What is that texture? Uh, you know, if 84 is not the same as 75, which is not the same as 2020, and yet there is something recognizable or familiar, something that we sort of know in our bones, right? Um, and that is also one of, the, uh, one of the things. So one of the things that I was trying to think of is that to rob us of capacities of care, mm is one way to recognize that we're living in repressive systems, right? So the fact that this lost child who cannot be reunited with the family, that's something that haunts this person mm. who's, you know, uh, trying to recall this, right? Is It produces a capacity for reflection or thought, this yeah. haunting, right? This absence. Um, so I also, the question of care is also something that I've been trying to think of, uh, you know, in a uh, in an open way to try and assemble it again for myself. Because I think that when when systems and regimes take away from us um, or, or restrict uh, our spheres of care, mm. whether it's through time, whether it's through presence, um, you know, that I think is also in a certain kind of erosion that mm. we ought to be pushing back against. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, and it's... Uh wonderful that we listen or glimpse the tiger through the senses of the rabbit, if you like. Um, the rabbit's a great animal. And our word for rabbits in Hindustani is what? Khargosh, right? Which actually points to another animal. Because khargosh is the animal with the ears of a donkey. Khar is donkey, gosh is ears, right? So the rabbit is the, is the creature with the ears of a donkey. So when you say rabbit, you're actually pointing to a faculty of the rabbit, which is incredible. It's twitching ears. It's mm -hmm. high sensitivity to be able to listen for what's scurrying in, in time. So it may be not able to see what's right in front of its face, but it does listen to the, to the footsteps that are echoing in the, in the ground beneath. And that, I mean, I think that what the kind of work that you're doing, not just in this exhibition, but through all the things that you do, actually ask us to be attentive to a need for crosstalk between the senses. So there's a kind of, you're asking us for, to do the opposite of anesthesia, which is a dumbing of the senses, a numbing of the senses, 
to enter into aesthesis. The aesthetic is actually about awareness and the awareness between and across the senses so that even if we don't see things in totality, we're able to produce the vision of the heart, which is at the heart of the heart of the matter. Um, Kedarnath Singh's poem, I think I may be wrong, is in a, is in a classical meter. It's called the Shardul Vikritida meter. I don't remember the exact name. It is the meter that imitates the play of a tiger. It's 19 syllables. And it's a classical meter in Sanskrit carried over into much modernist Hindi poetry. So, and you know, at the beginning of the film, you have that Morse code going, mm. the, the beeps, right? Mm. And um, that's what made me curious about, hey, there's like a, there's like some calling attention to metrics, to meter here. Mm. I'm not saying you did that, but I'm saying what, that's what I did, right? Mm. And then I, then I, kind of half remembered. Isn't there a meter named after the tiger's play? Yes, there is. Shardul, Vikrita, whatever, right? 19 mm. syllables of short and long spondies. Um, but what does meter do? Meter or chand, as we say in Hindi, is actually just a replication of rhythmic patterns, again, like the heartbeat. So it's the fluttering heartbeat of the rabbit sensing the tiger through time is how I come back to it. That's mm. the heart of the heart of it for me. The heart of the heart indeed. Yeah. No, I think that there is this, uh, definitely, I think I was trying to jostle with uh, various kinds, like, you know, aesthetically in the work. I was trying to think of um, um, sound in a way that is um, uh, not, uh, that is rhythmic or sometimes arrhythmic, but not necessarily trying to stay away from musicality mm. or, or melody, right? I was thinking seriously about the sound of being hit. So some of us, you know, I was telling a close friend that, you know, when the Jamia, uh, sorry, when the Jama Masjid, the Lati charge had happened, you know, that was the first time I was hit with a Lati. Mm. And what that does is that when the first time you're very scared, obviously you're terrified because, you know, this patron is being swung. And But when it does hit you, what happens is that there is this kind of what follows is this rage, basically. Yeah. Pure fight, rage. Fight or flight. Yeah. So you don't feel the pain. You just yeah. feel angry, like yeah. really angry, right? So, um, so somehow, you know, that sort of sense, I wanted the sound of the film to have. Yeah. Right. That there is, you sense that moment of contact, but then you just also, you know, sense everything that comes rushing at you after. I think visually was also similar, right? That uh, yeah. there were times then I, when, you know, I tried, there is also, you know, I cropped the image of the marching That's policemen right. and their shadows in this, uh, you know, way. But I was continuously trying to think which part of the image can be taken away in order to heighten uh, a certain kind of mm. engagement with the with the scene and and I think that led me in several interesting yeah. directions so this rabbit vision I think the film is uh, unknowingly perhaps because now I know that this is how rabbits see but you know um, or don't see <laughs> or don't see or don't see but I think this rabbit vision uh, yeah. uh, link is super useful because uh, yeah. it's generative because I think that this is also what the film is doing with sound mm. and visual and of course, because, you know, editing is what I feel like uh, yeah. I have most uh, stake in. I think I also sort of try to do that with the cuts and, you know, where to not put a cut and let the image play and, you know, where to cut almost abruptly as well. So, yes. Thank you, Pallavi. It's wonderful always talking with you because every time I see stuff you do, it makes me go into rabbit holes. It <laughs> it makes me see things differently and anew. So, and I'm sure that that is what it will do to all the people who will come to see your show. So maybe we can put a pause to our rabbiting and have other people be in to talk, um, talk to Very you. Thankful this, for this conversation to the always am. And, and yes, this has been wonderful too. Uh, thanks very much, Shuddha and uh, Pallavi. Do we have any questions? Uh, you can either type or if somebody wants to unmute themselves and ask, please feel free.
think everybody's still in their rabbit holes. There is a question which has come to my direct message, which is by Seema. Hi, Seema. Uh, and the question is, I'm just reading it out and then I will attempt to answer it. Hi, what do you mean by making work or not making work that creates witnesses? How, okay. Uh, yes. So, um, um, thanks, Seema. I'll respond to the second part of your uh, question privately. Um, but um, yes, the, the, the idea of witnessing, um, you know, is basically that you have a certain kind of, I think, um, authentic uh, recall of what has happened, right? And you're also able to encapsulate it fully. And somehow that testimony uh, is, uh, you know, is seen as, as uh, a, ha is seen to have a capture on, on anything that has happened, on an event, on an occurrence, etc. Uh, and when that happens, especially in documentary, what that does is that it produces this imagination of just trying to commit to memory or, um, you know, uh, capture fully something, um, you know, either from history or, or you know, from, from your present, etc. And I think this is problematic because this is where thought ceases. This is where, you know, uh, you stop searching for more, you stop looking you stop reassembling it and, and seeing it in multiple ways. So um, yeah, uh, I think that that's what I mean by trying to continuously uh, push for work that goes beyond the creation of just witnessing and doesn't place the entire onus of uh, interpretive, um, uh, you know, um, sort of pushing yourself interpretively um, uh, in other ways then, you know, then if you're just a witness, it, it doesn't it doesn't seem to me uh, to be enough to just produce witnessing Don't think we have any other questions. I like the silence. <laughs> For people who are in Bombay, please go and uh, go to the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research and do some matha teko because that is where Alexander Grothendieck once came, who is the author of the phrase Heart of the Heart. And he did a series of seminars on uh, algebraic topology that. Um, really revolutionized a generation of mathematicians in India, and they still talk about him in hush, hushed tones. So Bombay has a point of contact. Yeah. Shuddha, would you have the poem here? The bar, handy? Maybe one of you can read it out because so much reference was made, then that might be a nice way to end it. Which one? Kedarnath Singh's poem? Yes, Kedarnath Singh's uh, poem. Do you have it, Pallavi? Or you can play the bit well, uh, it comes and goes in different, but maybe yeah. you can say that. Uh, you just can... the beginning of the beginning. film, maybe? Yeah. Should you yeah. just play the beginning of the film? Yeah. Okay, you have to give me a second. I'll pull it up. I do think Rohit has typed in the um, chat on the side, which says he has a question. So please, un you can unmute and just yeah. ask. Yes. And I'll also pull up the film in the meanwhile. Okay, hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Okay, well, uh, sort of first, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful talk, just so thoughtful, a wonderful conversation, um, Shilda and Balabi, and a uh, wonderful show. I can't wait to see it when I'm, when I'm back in Bombay. And uh, Sri, thank you so much for, for, for hosting it. Um, so what I, I mean, I love the work, I mean, I, like, from, from what you've seen from afar. I mean, I'm not sure what you think about the idea of seeing something from afar, uh, but uh, but I, I love the idea because I was able to see threads or like a thread that kept the three major work or works or set of works uh, together. Um, 
one of the strongest threads, I think, or one of the strongest foundations of the thread uh, was the Shroud of Turin. And I, I think I'm sort of echoing some of Shuddha's comments here. So um, uh, forgive me for repeating because I also had to, my internet went down. And so if I'm repeating something, then just you can ignore this. Uh, but uh, the Shroud of Turin is super interesting for me, right? Uh, uh, it's a very monotheistic, obviously, right? Um, uh, uh, textile. <laughs> uh, but what's so interesting is the absolutely massive, and here I'm appealing to one of Shuddha's words, uh, void that it serves to create. I mean, it's created, it created, a, it, it, like there, there, there's just, it, it's a void as to the burial of Christ right that the very cloth of his burial has created insofar as nobody knows whether it's real or not there's like constant fights you know like since the 15th century over you know the authenticity of the shroud of turin right um uh and there's that it's precisely that ambiguity right that creation of a gap i love the rabbit hole um it made uh, you know, the, the, the blind rabbit, uh, you know, re, should those comments reanimated that film for me. Um, I love the rabbit hole sort of idea. Um, so uh, the ambiguity of the Shroud of Turin itself cultivates a theology of faith of sorts. Um, um, is he dead? Is he not? Right. That's precisely what Christ incarnated is. Right. Um, Christ is not. Uh, there's the God and there's a man. Christ is man. Becomes man in the very death of the combination of of God and man. Um, and so, he, here's a generation of an absolute whole or void. Right at the center of. Of, of, of human life, right? Um, it's, it's literally the moment of creatio ex nihilo, right? Uh, creating out of nothing. Um, and so the Shroud of Turn is super, super interesting. And so now I'm gonna ask like, the annoying, or annoying question, right? which is, I feel like the works are so strong and that they, they generate in me a tarrying with the negative, a tarrying with the, with the void, right? Um, they cultivate the void without making me feel psychotic. Um, maybe it's because I've seen them from before. Hopefully I will not feel psychotic when I see them in situ. But, um, but what, what, what is to be done? Uh, what is to be done um, with the very opportunity that you're staging in your work, right? Which is the opportunity for us to rethink the, the fact that every day we can, what makes humans unique is that we're inadequate, that we always have an opportunity to create ex nihilo out of nothing. There's no instinctual blueprint to us. There's always a void that undergirds us. So what is to be done, right? I mean, it's a beautiful gesture, I think, you know, like not just a gesture, it's a beautiful politics, you know, it's a messianism of sorts, um, uh, the work. And and so, how, 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 so, so, so then what, what does creation look like in this time of utter catastrophe? So you've done that work, that really hard work of carving the gap, right? Which is difficult enough, right? So just asking for a bit more, what, what will it look like to, to sew it up so that we can maintain the gap uh, at the same time that we move as 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 political and ethical beings together, right? so, is there anything in the work that you think suggests that, or is there not? Or was the aim of the work critical, theoretical, right, to carve the gap? So. Um, thanks for that question, Rohit. I will attempt to have a go at it, and then maybe also ask Shuddha to come with some thoughts. But um, since the question is primarily directed to the works themselves, I 
you know, so for me, I think one thing um, uh, is that the work is just as the method is resisting a certain kind of positivistic capture of the world, the work is also not a positivistic sort of um, encapsulation of what it can do or what is possible or what is to be done, right? Um, so um, in that sense, everything um, that um, is possible uh, to do is not, the work is, is one mode of sensing that and, and, you know, is not in that sense a complete document or a complete, um, uh, you know, sort of uh, repository of, of everything that, that is to be done in that sense, right? I think what is to be um, done in that sense is to not, for me, I think, is, is, the, is the idea that you don't feel paralyzed just as catastrophe has no, what makes catastrophe catastrophe is that it has no temporal boundaries, right? It continues, it spills out, it's, it continues to happen, right? Um, I think the making of works, creativity and creation in the face of catastrophe is similar, that it has to continue. Uh, and, and very interestingly, the the framework within which the film or, or some of the other works actually also started uh, was five million incidents, which actually um, called the people who were doing projects actants, you know. So there is um, the, the actionable or, or, or things to be done are very much in the um, foreground, right? But without the burden, of a certain kind of positivistic, journalistic, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 hubris of trying to have a, a complete capture of the story. So um, I think that that's what I would say. Um, uh, and I think the connection that you're drawing between the shout of Turin and the idea of the negative, and then what does that negative actually signal to in terms of our capacity to do to, to do or to work and, and produce and create, I think that's a very uh, insightful connection. And I would try and attempt to extend it just by saying that um, what is to be done is also to not look at the work uh, as a, a, a kind of a, a neat tally of what is to be done, because that would go against the method itself uh, of trying to, um, you know, resist this kind of complete and utter capture of everything. Uh, while not reneging the space of creating. Uh, so that, that would be a provisional response, but I will definitely think about what you've said. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you. Uh, do you want me to say something about yes. that? Yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Rohit. Um, I think Pallavi, from what I heard in the conversation, actually also gave us a key to what is that attitude which is more than the critical analytical attitude, which is how you ended your question. And she pointed to a language of care or of custodianship. Um, the whole uh, keeps reappearing. Um, but I would have a slightly different vantage point from you uh, we are not faced with realities ex nihilo, but we are faced, I think, with realities that are wounded. Uh, so the hole is a wound that keeps reappearing. It's a gap, it's a fissure, things tear apart. And I think that part of what I learned from art like this is that there is also the possibility that one mends, that one repairs, right? So if you take the Blind Rabbit film, it's an effort by let's say these men and women who have served in the police to offer a kind of mending of the fact that they faked the files and then erased the files. So the recall is a double stitch in time. They're repairing the damage done by the fakery as well as the damage done by the erasure. And that is work that needs to be done all the time, every day. Um, in in um, the um, there's a since you brought up the man whose body uh, we tend to think of the shroud of Turing as only the face of Jesus Christ, but actually you see the entire body of a very tall man, 
a tall naked man with very long fingers covering his genitals. Uh, so he's a man, he's the son of man. Um, a close contemporary of Jesus or Jesse or Joshua was another Jewish rabbi called Hillel. And he was asked, um, so tell me what is the Torah standing on one foot? And he said a, a sentence that has passed down in many different ways. He said, very simple, just don't do to others what is hateful to you. And if others do what is hateful, then repair the damage. And he said, that is the entire Torah. Everything else is just explanation and annotation. So I think that what this business of mending in the, the Hebrew Aramaic word for it is tikkun, is you know, the constant repair, um, which is not reforming stuff. It's not making things better when they're worse, but it's mending. It's, it's patience. It's a kind of, if you like, in Kilabi, revolutionary patience. And I think the attitude of the works holds that for me. Thank you. Yeah. And uh, Shoda, if I can say just one more quick thing, I, 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 it's more of a question again, uh, just on this comment. But how, how can that not turn into a reformism then, right? I mean, uh, which is uh, how can repair and uh, like an ontology or an essence of woundedness not just turn into a because uh, I see the works not as that right or you know like um, uh, uh, as as uh, a sort of uh, desire to positivize the wound as an identity right which I think you've said in in your opening in, or in in your opening remarks you know about about how the work transcends identity, right? Um, but how, how, might, how, how might, you know, sort of um, a constant effort to repair, right, in that rabbinical tradition, not lead to what we've seen historically, right, which is um, a, a constant, uh, you know, anticipatory regret for bad things done, right? Um, uh, uh, confessional politics. I mean, nowadays we see so many uh, uh, people who have killed, um, maimed, tortured, um, uh, actually confessing in in too much detail to what they've done. I think in, in over proximity to what they've done. Um, uh, to uh, uh, that, that actually shores up their power in a certain sense. That I was able to do that to a body. You know, um, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't act like, so repair might not, like the framework of wound and repair seems to have been co-opted by the very machine that, that, that we want to be, or that I, I see the works as, as wanting to criticize, but I'll stop there. But I, yeah. I your very thoughtful responses. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I just will say that that's why I said repair, not reform not even reparation. Repair doesn't necessarily mean that the wound or the damage done is papered over. Uh, I drive a very dented car and the more it gets dented, the more it gets mended and the more the dents accumulate in the car. It, they don't create like a ship of Jesus like new car. They, they, they basically ask me, how do you drive a badly battered vehicle. And I think that's an attitude of repair that I'm interested in, which doesn't pretend that things get better, but which asks, what do we need in order to be able to live from day to day? Which is not the same thing I would argue as reform, which pretends that there is a kind of reassignment of parts, things have been made new again, Repair is all about the stuff being old. And also repair is uh, uh, interrupt accumulation um, in, in, in that sense, you know, in a way there is a, uh, in a way there is a, a recall, uh, you know, it's a resistance against the amnesia, um, you know, that uh, again, repressive systems would want us to have. But it's also um, trying to 
uh, I think also resist accumulation in a very material way. Uh, but I also see what Rohit is saying about, but what happens, you know, if we just keep repairing and not completely, you know, restructuring uh, things. So it's a, uh, I think, yeah, in the work, I, for me, the, the idea of recalling is more, it appears more like haunting uh, as opposed to the need to um, reform anything. So in that sense, yeah, I don't think why care and repair go very closely together. I don't think the idea is to just repurpose older structures to continue to, you know, propagate the same kind of violence, etc. There's a question from uh, Sabi or a comment, uh, which basically says that um, he refers um, Fazlullah, the 14th century uh, theologian, philosopher, mystic, and talks about the language of the Hurufis. And he's talking about the heart as a sensory organ and as a form of intelligence. And yes, I totally agree. And I think the heart is a sensory organ. And the proof of that is the fact that your heartbeats get faster or slow down when you sense things. So the rhythm of uh, your you know, circulation itself is, is an indicator of the fact that you are feeling stuff, you're, there's stimulation, there's you know, all that's going on, it's heartbeat. Inder also has his hand up. Hi, Pallavi. Am I audible? Yes, you are. Okay. First of all, congratulations. Really, uh, you know, I, I would really love to be there and physically see what you know how it is displayed and walk through these spaces and and see the see the actually works in detail, which which is not available in this format. So anyway, I was uh, really enjoyed this wonderful conversation between you and Shuddha and uh, many, many beautiful things I heard first time and really thanks to both of you. Uh, I think I just, my little input would be that, you know, uh, you know how the aesthetic layering, you know, how inevitably, you know, creeps into this whenever we think of about this witness thing, uh, for example, Aga Shahid Ali, uh, wonderfully actually, you know, uh, in his one of his wonderful poems, that how Shahid is, is in Persian means the loud, and, and Shahid in Arabic means witness. Am I, am I audible? Okay, so uh, this, you know, um, this, this is a linguistic twist here. And uh, whenever we think of uh, how to kind of give a kind of a presentation of that witness, because the first, first Shahid is is somewhere in the metaphysical space you know and then when we when we talk about the witness we are we are dealing with the trace you know and if we go even a little bit further you know think of uh, this trace in let us say manto talks about this uh, you know about smell boo in his one of wonderful story about how how it is how it haunts him for his whole life that that character called randeer singh uh, that smell haunts him for his whole life you know it's about love but, the, but when we talk about violence, so this trace haunts you, know, the way you talk about, you know, about the smell of the dead and this, uh, the chemicals which preserve it and the, how the body is decomposed there, you know, that haunts where Shuddha also talks about that how it haunts you. You know, uh, that is how uh, kind of, you know, we are kind of somehow inheritors of those, those uh, traces and uh, and inevitably, we, we, we are going back into, into the Shaheed part of it, which is somewhere in the metaphysical space, you know. And also in the Manto's case, also, the, his memory, you know, he, he's haunted by that, the presence of that smell of the woman with whom he made a, a kind of one night stand. So there is this strange, you know, uh, kind of blending of our aesthetic learning, which we, whenever we come out with some some idea of what is violence, which is inevitable. And I think, I think that's what I, I think about. And what do artists is kind of, a, you know, uh, in, in a cell of this slow martyrdom, you know, slowly dissolving into this, into this you know, presentation, you know, invariably coming out regularly that, hey, hello, this is the violence. Hello, this is my trauma. Hello, this is my celebration. Hello, this is my, my kind of participation in that, 
you know, in the revival of that uh, idea, wherever the metaphysical space, wherever those have gone, the dead people, you know. So this is a very, uh, of course, about languages and how the how the gap actually widens sometimes between the word and the meaning, and we we bring out some new mechanisms to to bring that you know some cohesiveness to the language. So this is a very complicated. That's why art is a very complicated language. Even even Joseph Boyce talks about here that everybody is an artist in that sense because because everybody has their own story to tell. So for me, that is what 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 fascinates me. Whenever we talk about art, not as a not as I don't specialist dealing with aesthetic, you know, problems here, but definitely each and every person have their own you know, how they accumulate this, this uh, uh, their own personal memories and what is happening around us all the time. So wonderful! I I didn't have I don't know whether I can formulate the question if I go continuously, but thanks to listen to you again. Wonderful! Thanks. Congratulations again. Wonderful. Lovely. Okay. Thanks. thanks. Thanks for that comment in there. I just do, the only thing I would say is that memory is not always only personal. And I don't want to necessarily only think of it as a, in the domain of the, of the personal. I think there is something structural also that needs to not be uh, reneged or disavowed while at the same time um, being, uh, you know, attending to the kind of gaps or the nuances, I think, in which they shift register or, you know, come to us in a certain way, et cetera. So I think that the moment of encounter um, as opposed to the content of the memory is very uh, useful for me to work with in my, in my practice. But that was very, uh, very expansive and most interesting. Thanks. Thank Thank, thanks, thanks, thanks. Thank you. Okay, I think we are kind of done and it's 7.30 on a Friday night here in India. And uh, I don't know, I'm sure Pallavi, you have the whole day left in Berlin. Yes, so, four uh, o'clock. Yeah. So thank you very much, Pallavi and Shuddha. And thank you to Sabia and Dia, for the technical backup who's sort of been running around and you know fixing everything. And thank you for all of you who came in and stayed and, uh, you know, ask questions. Thank you very much. And for those in Bombay, I hope you come and see the exhibition. Thank you and good night. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pallavi. Thank you, Sri. Thank, thank you, all of you. Uh, thanks, Sri. Thanks, Bia. Thanks, Bia. Thank you.